Well, good morning, and good morning to those that are out there uh, watching via live stream. We're so thankful that you're here and that we can be worshiping together. And you may, in the scripture reading, wonder what the deal is because uh, the title that I gave was Resolutions 101 for 2021. But in the providence of Almighty God, uh, I think we are exactly where we need to be in the book of Ephesians. For what we have before us in this text, and you should be aware of that, as we're moving through Ephesians, the first three chapters had to do with doctrine, God's work in salvation, that great salvation that He is bringing in the history of mankind to people as He has chosen out of darkness to be in the marvelous light. And then when we, in, we started in chapter 4, we started with the walk with God because in this world, because of that great salvation, what are we supposed to be and what are we supposed to do? Who are we in relation to the world? And all of that is found here. And we've already worked our way through the first 16 verses of chapter 4, that beginning with that idea of walking worthy of the calling with which we have been called. So we have to understand and un all of this in this righteous kind of context that God in sovereignty is directing all events and situations of all of our lives. He hasn't lost control. He knows what he is doing. And somehow he moves in accordance also with our choices. Now, as we, and I'm happy to do so, frankly, approach 2021, we're not looking to uh, make something physically happen ourselves. We're looking to Him. But we also recognize that we have a responsibility to walk worthy of the calling for which we have been called. And this first 16 verses had to do with walking worthy within the bounds of the church which God had raised up. And these Ephesians were one of the first churches from the book of Acts that were brought about by the work of God, a people that would worship the true and the living God. And now he turns, beginning in verse 17, to us as individuals. And he sets before us really what I think, or what our resolutions are. And we talk, you know, people, everybody talks about, eh, what's your New Year's resolution? I'm going to lose 150 pounds or whatever. Please don't lose that much. But you understand what I mean. But this sets the Christian standard. We don't even have to come up with them. God has given them to us. And I believe right here. Now, when we get beyond this, He's going to tell us how to do that. Get into detail. Lord hasn't left us out here on a limb where He hasn't advised us of these things. But here He tells us what is pleasing to Him for you and me and what we're going to look at, of course, is timeless. Let me ask God to help us again just briefly as we look at His precious Word. Father, we thank you that you are with us. And if you're with us, who can be against us? Oh, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you that we have your map, your wonderful word to tell us how we are to live and that we can come to you and cling to you by faith in what you have promised in your precious word. Our health may be declining. We may have terrible problems and issues and the and the world is deteriorating around us, or whatever would be our great concerns. But we know that you are there, and that you are with us, and we praise you. And I ask you to bless us today from your word, to give us direction, Father, that we might be encouraged as we move in to 2021, if it be your will, if we get there. And Father, that you would be with us and guide us, Lord through your precious word, and we ask this in Jesus' name, 
Amen. Now, life's a journey, right? It is a journey, and it and here, here's uh, 2020 is past, and 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 there's nothing about 2020 that we could change because it's behind us. And frankly, I want to be like what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3 when he said, uh, forgetting what lies behind, I press on towards the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's where we need to be because we can't do anything about the past. I wish we could sometimes, and, and you know, I'm sure you do too, but we can't. But we look at what is in front of us, and 2021 is a mystery. And the only thing we can do about it is trust God and choose obedience to His Word which He sets before us as a type of a road map that we need and we are so blessed to have. Now, if I were to give a little State of the Union message, if our anchor is fixed on uh, the good things that are happening in our world, and our politics, and our jobs, or whatever, and I hope there's some good things there for you. But a Christian assessment of the world, starting with a large picture and then bringing it down to us, is a right setting of understanding for us. And in this living section in which we're in here, in, in this journey that we're talking about, in Ephesians, that's what these that were living 2,000 years ago had to do. They were living under a regime that was oppressive and ugly. And the last time under this practice, we looked at the church and its necessity and components, and he brings it now down to us. And, and we are reminded that we are not to be those, 1 Thessalonians 5.4 says that, we're not in the dark. We have the light of God's word before us, and so that is always what we follow on this pathway, this journey of life. The world's all around us, and we have no choice but to live in it. But God's in control. He hadn't lost it. He's ultimately the, the, the almighty, sovereign king of glory. And, the, and I have always been a patriot. I have. And I'm thankful to live in the USA. Knowing so many blessings, so many physical blessings that we have, particularly... Two years ago, I went, you know, for a conference in Mozambique, and uh, the people over there, they literally have nothing. And, but there's a spirit among at least the Christians there in their thinking and a type of joy. And, but they're not hopeful in the world, but they're hopeful in Christ because they just don't have much. They don't have hardly anything. And most of them don't even know that. But you know, I came home, I landed over in Austin, and the first thing I did after I hit the ground and got in my car was head for Whataburger. <laughs> and, and that's just a reminder of the fact that we have many physical privileges, at least I consider that a privilege, here. Yeah, we, I ride, and I think we all do, in nice cars, on mostly nice roads, in uh, to nice homes, and all of that. And yet, at the fundamentally in our nation, we know, those of us that have any insight and in thinking, that at the most powerful and advantageous positions of government and institutions and influence, there's a type of rotting away rapidly that is taking place. If you look back at Ephesians in our context, Ephesians chapter 2, and look at verse 2. Here's Paul talking, and he says, "...in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience." Well, that's the majority of the people, even that are running things, 
in our country and the most powerful in our nation and all of that. And what are they under the influence of? The prince of the power of the air. And so don't be surprised at the fiery trials that encompass us in the world in which we live. And I think the USA can be summed up by looking at the Boy Scouts of America. You know, the, I was a Boy Scout. I know Don Dickey was an Eagle Scout. There may be some others here in our congregation that were high-ranking scouts. I, the scouts were great. And their theme was God and country. God and country. But yet in 20, around 2014, they'd been struggling with it for years. They compromised. They compromised with the world and with the powers that be and the influence of those powers, and they brought in homosexual leadership and other things. And you may know today that the Boy Scouts are in disarray with scandal and corruption. There are more than 92,000 complaints of abuse among young children that were in scouts and they are under bankruptcy. Now I think that that speaks in a, in a smaller way of what is happening and the pressure that is happening on our nation as in God we trust, just like the God in Boy Scouts has been tainted and really and truly it no longer exists in the manner in which it was intended. Ronald Reagan was one that said America will cease to be great when it ceases to be good. And part of the confusion is that many people in our nation no longer know what the definition of good is. And that good is whatever someone decides it to be, therefore murdering the unborn. That's good. Defunding police. That's good. Having no morals. That's good. Having no restrictions on evil. Well, that's good too. Because that's, we have decided, is what true freedom is. It's freedom to do anything under God's, as God's creation that we determine we want to do. And this pervasive situation is not just, of course, in America, but it pervades the world. And we used to be sort of leading the standard of the world as supposedly a Christian nation, and that we were noted for our mercies and kindnesses and our benevolence and our justice and all of those things that made us sort of the banner for the world to look to. And I fear, and this is just my assessment, that that has been turned largely into a something smelly and wretched because of what we have become. And all of this to say, too, that we are approaching the day of the Lord. Now, we talked about that last Sunday, that the pouring out of God's wrath on the world will come just before His second coming. And those closest in true biblical understanding agree the season is on us. And Christ will remove His church. And, and knowing this and seeing it by faith, how can we live in such difficulty in 2021? That may be on your mind. Certainly it's been on mine. Well, let me just say first that we're in the world, but not of the world. 
and we know the world is temporary. And our foundation and hope is not really here. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't fight for what is right and good and all of those kinds of things, and I trust that we are, within the bounds of, of human decency and, and kindness and love and compassion and so forth and so on. But God is doing what in the world? That's the issue. May I take you momentarily back to Ephesians 1 and 4. Notice what he says. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before Him. That's what He did. He has chosen a people out of that world. And the most important issue is, are you, the cho are you part of that chosen group? When we come over to chapter 2, and we read that we were dead in trespasses and sins, chapter 2, verse 1. And then we, but because of that, we go down to verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. We get to verse 5 and He says, He made us alive. He's made us different in Him. When we got to chapter 3, it was all about the church that God has formed to help us to know God and to walk with God and to live for God. And then when we get to chapter 4, as I've already said, He commands us to walk worthy of this calling that we have been called. And that's what we're supposed to do in 2021. Now, He makes this all exceedingly timeless, doesn't He? could fit any year. It has for the last 2,000 years. But we also know that Paul talked to, P, uh, to Timothy about the fact that in the last days, perilous times will come. And he lists all those things in 2 Timothy and chapter 3 that the times will be like, and it looks like our newspaper today. We don't walk in ignorance. We don't live in ignorance. But it is, com it is upon us to be a light to the world. It is upon us to walk worthy. It is upon us to do what He tells us to do in our text that was just read. So let's jump in at verse 17 after my long introduction here, okay? He says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. That, that little phrase, so this I say, is really translated or can be translated, therefore, which does exactly what we just did in a moment ago, and that is connects us back to everything that Paul has stated, not focusing on the world to fit in with the world, as many do, in fact, many churches are seeking to do that, in their compromise of the truth and trying to get along instead of being a light to the world. And, and this he's telling us, therefore, how should we think and live as a result of what God has done? And he says here also, affirm together with the Lord. That seems strange. Everything Paul says is of the Lord. This is an insp the inspired Word of God. But he's showing here this extreme emphasis or importance on what Paul is about to declare. It's like when Christ was on the earth and he's, he spoke to the crowds and he would say, truly, truly. He, had to do, he said it twice. Not just truly, because everything he said was truth. Thy Word is truth. But it was an emphasis, and that's what we have here. Here's, there is this constant pressure to compromise. I don't like being out of sync with everybody else. I don't like swimming upstream. I don't like being unpopular. I don't like people saying nasty things about me or something. You know, there's that fanatic, that nutcase or whatever. But we can't compromise with the world. He says here, you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Now, he's talking here about how we live. And life is a journey 
a journey that God has, is orchestrating and put before us. He knows exactly where we are. And that's why David could say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? The Lord is with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, all of everything that's going on, and believe me, there's some ugly, ugly stuff going on. I know in many of your lives there are ugly things going on and ugly things going on in our country. And we could become despondent and say, what's the use? But our Lord is with us. He tells us in Samuel that them that honor me, I will honor. And we honor Him by following His directions. That's what faith really is. Now the unsaved have a focus problem. What is their focus on? It's on the world, isn't it? How can I conquer whatever, climb to the top of the heap for the next day? How can I, you know, make the most money? That's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with trying to make money or, or, or maybe put somebody else down so I can go up or whatever. But a Christian, by definition, is a new person. In fact, go back across the page with me to Ephesians chapter 2, Again, in the section having to do with God's work, notice in a capsule what he, Paul says in verses 8 beginning. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. You didn't even do that. Even your faith is a gift. All of that's a gift. Not as a result of work so that nobody can boast. No man can boast. But notice, for we are His workmanship. He's working on us if you have this faith. Created in Christ Jesus, what? For good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk, there's that word again, in them. We would have our journey through life understanding who's in charge and, and, and living according to God's pattern and His clear commands. That's what this is all about. And you see, when we go back to our text in verse 18, and he's talking here not to walk as the Gentiles in the futility of their mind. What is that futility? That's the word for vanity. We think some of you are very familiar with the, the writing of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. When, when Solomon tried to live like the world, he said it becomes nothing. In fact, that word has its root, vapor. And it's like a person trying to grab the air and he, you open a hand and what do you have? Nothing. And that's what people are spending their life in futility. Because outside of Christ, everything is Futility, and he goes on in verse 18 to explain that. He says, being darkened in their understanding. Darkened in their understanding. Spiritual blindness that was already spoken of again in Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Dead in trespasses and sin. And he says, excluded from the life of God. No spiritual life. Dead. And he even says here the ignorance that is in them. And many of them have PhDs and everything else. But they're ignorant of what is really counts. None of our thinking can begin, or any man's thinking can begin to match the thinking of God. How foolish. How ridiculous is mankind in their thinking. And, and so, it... It, and he says here in verse 18, that is in them because of the hardness of their heart, ultimately all the unsaved have an incurable heart problem. And that's why God must invade the life. And that's why the necessity of the new birth is there. And the repentance from sin and a true coming to Christ 
with the idea and of I cast it all upon Him. My hope is exclusively in Him. And I turn to Him and I say, I'm going to take up my cross and I'm going to follow you. I'm not going to follow the world. And I'm not going to try to have one hand on the world and one hand on Christ. That won't work either. Because we all need a nature change. Peter, I always think of that one in 2 Peter, <coughs> pardon me, in chapter 2, he talks about the people in the church that are apostates. That, that means they're really not Christian. And, and, the, and the problem is they're like a pig, he talks about. Not, you know, no offense, but they get scrubbed up and cleaned and they can put some perfume on them. But guess what? As soon as you let them go, where do they go? Back into the pig pen. Because why? Their nature has not been changed. It's who they are by nature. They become callous. And that is the spiraling that we have worshipped around many times in understanding in Romans chapter 1. That is, as a person suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, God gives them over. And they become more and more calloused to the truth until finally they are so, so completely calloused in, in the, the all kinds of perversion and terrible things that that becomes to them what is good and right and clean and all of that. And it, everything is turned upside down. There are three major points that I'll just step aside for a moment to make. And uh, I've got to hurry along here. I'm already too windy here. People are to blame for their spiritual blindness and will be held accountable in judgment. Christ himself said that in John 3.19. He says that judgment has come into the world But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that that all are under obligation, he says in that same text, to repent and love Christ. In fact, by the way, that's found in John 3.36 in that same same context where, where it says, He who believes in the Son has life. But he who does not, he uses the word, obey the Son, will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Not a pretty picture. And the only solution, then, is Christ. Is hearing and receiving Christ. That's what Romans 10, 17 says. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And every person is known by two things. Their words and their actions. You think about that. Their words. In fact, Christ talks about every word that man speaks, he will be held accountable for. And their actions. And, and in the context of this, in this world in which we're trying to fit and get along moving into 2021, we are also told that we cannot be unequally yoked because what relationship has light with darkness? And yet we have to find our way in this and try to get along, but we can't do that by compromising. We can't do that by forsaking God's Word and God's truth. And when that comes down to push and shove, whatever it takes to stand on truth and righteousness is absolutely necessary for each one of us But always keep in mind, he's in control. And he's testing, 
He's testing. He's testing you. And he's testing me. I don't much care for this testing business. I never did like tests in school. I sure don't like tests in life. But that's what we're called to do until we're glorified. Keep trusting him. Keep waiting on him. Now let me move on in verse 20. And, and let me uh, back up to 19 and say, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now that's what the world is doing. But that's not what we're supposed to do. And that's what he says in verse 20. But you did not learn Christ in this way. At conversion, and uh, you didn't learn Christ like that. This whole issue of conversion is being converted from this place of dead in trespasses and sin to this position in Christ Jesus who is the light. And God didn't call us in terms of impurity. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 tells us that. And one of the many things wrong with a lot of modern evangelism and a lot of modernistic churches is the true gospel conversion is not really explained or dealt with leading one to think they can accept Jesus, they can make a decision for Christ, and they can still hold on to the world, and they can compromise with the world, and they can live in sin, and in, in effect, they're rejecting Christ with their lives while saying they accept Him with their mouth. And you can't serve God and mammon. You know, the words of Christ Himself are very clear about this. He says in Matthew 7, 16, that very important sermon on the mount, you will know them by their fruits. And he goes even further and says, every good tree. He's talking there about who's really his. Every good tree bears good fruits. What are you going to produce? You're talking about resolutions in 20 21, am I going to be finally just so pressured by the world, so put down by the world, so deflated in the world that I'm going to start going along to get along? Or are you going to walk with Christ, be the light of the world? Back in our text, verse 21 Paul says, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, if indeed brings into question even their understanding of the truth or even their relationship to Christ, either or both. In other words, if you think salvation is anything less than what has been explained here beginning in chapter 1, you're either not fully taught or you have not yet received this great salvation. Because this is the salvation. It's not something that we can make up and, and have it want to have it our way. And by the way, it wouldn't be worth anything, and that's the problem if it was our way, would it? We need God's way. We need God's way. And so he begins here in verse 22, this committed, what I'll call, I call here transition. Here are the general resolutions. Now, he's going to tell us beyond this, we don't get there today, everything that we should be doing to live for Christ Jesus. But here he tells us, here's the goal. Here is your resolutions, really for all of your life, but it's certainly true for 2021. And beginning in verse 22, he said that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Lay aside is something that we have to do. God doesn't do that for us. He saves, 
But it's our responsibility to lay aside our former manner of life. Listen, if you're still in love with your former manner of life, there's something wrong. Why do you want to go back to that? Why do you want to go back to the pigsty? There's something wrong. Think of a prisoner, and this is like a picture here, of changing clothes. That's what he's making. Putting off and putting on. Thinking of a, a guy that's been in prison, and he gets out of prison and he still wants to wear his prison clothes. Well, that's, that's, what we're, that's how crazy that is. That doesn't make any sense. And, and, and the, the whole idea here is this, don't be your old self. Ridding your, ourselves of the old self in pursuit of Christ is not something that we can just passively do or, or, or you can do that if you want to and if you feel like it and, and if you want to be you know, one of the better Christians or something. No. This is for every Christian. Our responsibility to change is brought carefully to us in Scripture as we fight the good fight of faith. I always think of that passage in, in uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not something easy. Knowing it is God who's working in you both to will and work His good pleasure. This is a struggle. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. And that's what we are all to be about. And this, in verse 23 he says, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The saved person is not stagnant any more than the unsaved is stagnant in their sinfulness. Just like Romans 1. Sinners spiral downward in their sin. It is a progressive type of spiraling downward. The saved should be spiraling upward. Oh, that I may know Him. That I may know Him more fully, more completely, more all the time. That's because we're going ultimately to be glorified and made like Him. Why wouldn't we not want to be more like Him right now? And of course, we know that we find that to be true in God's Word. Think back just for a moment. Look back at chapter 4 and verse 11 to 13, where he's talking about the church and their responsibility. And he says he gave some as, pa as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. There it is. That's the spiraling upward, you see. And he says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And he even gives us the result in verse 14. We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and de deceitful scheming. We're not to be caught up with every... Thing it's blowing around in the world. One day it's blowing this way, the next day it's going to blow this way. We're fixed, fixed in Jesus Christ on the narrow way, the true way, the, un, the unchanging way that leads to life. How much better is that? God doesn't change, and His Word doesn't change, and His people are not supposed to change in their faithfulness and steadfastness to Him. And so they're supposed to grow up in Him. So we get to verse 24, and really this is the one we've been shooting for the whole time. Here we go. So thank you for your forbearance. But look at verse 24. He says, and put on the new self. This is, like I said, it's like putting on clothing. It's something that we must do. It's something that we work on. You know, salvation is by grace, but that doesn't mean we don't have our part in that effort if we have received His gift of mercy by grace. We have a responsibility. 
a great responsibility. We put on the new self. And he says, which is in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now there's three things here that are clearly stated, and these are our resolutions, our targets for 2021. They're our targets before we even get to 2021. <laughs> before Friday this week, or I think it's Friday, whatever. He says, likeness of God. The, the likeness of God. Now, we represent Christ to everyone around us. You know, where do you think the world is in a state of blindness and lostness and confusion, and they need someone to come into that arena and point them to Jesus Christ. And that's what your role is, and that's what my role is. There's no higher calling than that, and it belongs to every person who names the name of Christ. And it's just simply put, if we're a Christian, act like it. Live it out. The only possible way to do that is what? Through prayer and being in God's Word. Because otherwise, you're being attacked with all kinds of gunk and junk and confusion and mess continually, but you are one that resides in the truth of God and you're clinging to God by faith in everything that you do. And he says here as well, in verse 24, in right, create has been created in righteousness. Righteousness is found only in His Word. And you know, the temptation is all around us. All around. Every one of us. It's not... Young people may have more of the temptations in some sense than older, us older people do, but every one of us have all manner of temptations to turn our face from the holy and righteous God to something else on a continuing basis. And, and, and we cannot. Oh, I say this to everyone. And I say it to myself. We cannot play with fire without getting burned. He's going to tell us later and we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. We wrestle with these unseen forces in heavenly places in chapter 6. All that's important to understand. There's a spiritual warfare going on around you, around me, around us right now that is for our very soul to, to, to drag us away from God, to drag us away from the truth of His Word, to take us away, to, to confuse us, to get us to deny whatever degree of righteousness and truth exists, to get us away from that, and to risk and lose our testimony before others. In the same way he says here in verse 24, in righteousness, and he says, and holiness of the truth. Now these two go together. Holiness of the truth, of course, holiness is that idea of being set apart. We're different. That's the whole idea. Dead in trespasses and sin, walking according to the prince of the power of the air, are set apart in holiness unto God. That's the difference. Holiness of the truth. Don't associate with any form of untruth. Don't live a lie or play games with or among those who love not truth and God. You can try to point them to Christ, but don't participate in their manner of life, in their manner of thinking. All lying is of the devil. Christ said that. He's the father of lies. Well, there's a lot of lying going on in this world now, isn't there? People didn't used to think that way. They used to think, oh, you know, your, your word was your bond anymore. It just psh, doesn't matter. It does matter, friend. It does matter. Holiness of the truth. 
Now from here to the end of this book, he will tell us how to do this. But here's the resolutions for you and me as we move into 2021, unchanging resolutions that we've just been reminded of here. And we know, I am convinced that we're in the last of the last days. And testing of our faith will be active in 2021. Christians are growing, I would say, wider in their variance from the world. We're over here, and they're over here, and that, that, that vein is growing greater and greater every day, and even for the norm in the what I'd call the good old USA. Because Christianity, I'm talking about true Christianity, is not popular anymore. And the issue is, will you and will I stand up for God and be counted as being in the battle for the very, for the very soul of ourselves and for others as well in this walk with God that has been the same walk that, was a, that they were talking about here 2,000 years ago and it continues today and it will continue until Christ Himself returns. There's really just one hope in 2021. One hope. Jesus Christ. But boy, He's more than what we think of as just a hope. He is real. And He's coming again. He's the God of this universe. And we will all stand before Him, either clothed in His righteousness by faith, or under His judgment. It's a big deal, isn't it? It's the biggest deal in our life. It's the biggest deal of your life. We're really just talking about living by faith, aren't we? And there's a verse of Scripture that's always sort of bothered me, found in Luke 18, 8, 8 and I'll close with that. Christ just pops out all of a sudden and says, When the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I think he's telling us that it's rare, but it's what's required. And so as we move forward in this journey, this walk, this walk that he says... Be worthy of the calling for which you were called. It's all summed up in that. Our faith, which is demonstrated by how we live and how we live before God when nobody else is around and how we live before others when others are around and when the pressure's on and the temptations are present and when the, the trials are present and all those things that will come because they will come and Christ is going to return. And the issue is, of course, will He find faith with you? Will He find faith with me? so that we could hear at the judgment day, well done, good, and faithful servant. Bow together with me, please, in prayer. Father, we thank you that we have your word to direct us again. Oh, help us not to just, you know, think about it for a few moments and then just, okay, well, let's go on our way, Lord. Help us, oh, Lord. Help me, help us all to walk worthy of the calling for which we have been called. Give us the strength by your Spirit to do that, to live for you and serve you, be found in you no matter what it costs us. So I pray, oh, help us, Lord. Bless everyone here, and if there's someone here or someone in the sound of my voice on live stream that knows you not, oh, work in their heart, please that they might know you truly and live for you. 
And for each one of us, encourage us and strengthen us in your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.